This is your invitation to leap ahead in your engineering career. The inaugural Product Development Expo, PDX, happening in Phoenix, Arizona on Tuesday, May 14th, 2024, brings you face to face with the engineering elite. These aren't just any speakers, they're the industry's highest performing product development engineers, ready to share the methods and strategies that have defined their success. Imagine learning design for manufacturability from those who've redefined it, diving deep into tolerance analysis with pioneers, exploring novel engineering applications for Excel, and unlocking unique 3D printing strategies all in one place. These high-caliber engineers will open their playbooks, offering practical, hands-on lessons forged over decades in the trenches of innovation. Don't miss out on this unparalleled opportunity to absorb the wisdom of those who've led the charge in engineering breakthroughs. PDX is your chance to not just meet but learn directly from these legends of engineering. Mark the date, May 14th, 2024, in Phoenix. Elevate your skills, ignite your creativity, and join a community of growth-minded engineering professionals at PDX. Learn more at teampipeline.us forward slash PDX. And enjoy today's episode featuring Ian McCathern, one of our esteemed PDX presenters. Even if you do everything exactly right and hire all the best experts in the world and do everything that you should do, it might be a spectacular failure initially, but you need to just do the work and just incrementally make those improvements and then get there and just kind of trust the process of engineering. Hello and welcome to the Being an Engineer podcast. Today we're speaking with Ian McCathern. And this is actually Ian's second appearance on the Being an Engineer podcast, a distinction shared by only one or two others. Ian is back to talk about R&D engineering today in this episode number five of six of our R&D series, exploring what it is to be an R&D engineer and how this role is unique from other engineering roles. Uh, for over 15 years, Ian has been helping cutting edge companies design highly complex products, including artificial hearts blood pumps, and Class three medical devices. Products Ian has designed are in Times Square, the Disney Parks, the Smithsonian, and implanted in people around the world. Ian, thank you so much for joining us again, and welcome back to the podcast. Thank you for having me. All right. So do you think of yourself, Ian, as specifically an R&D engineer or, or more just kind of a general engineer? And then how do you even define the distinction between those two? I, th I, I think of myself as both. I, I think R&D engineering is kind of a subset of, of engineering. It's kind of uh, subsumed by the Venn diagram, I guess. And I, I think that um, what separates an R&D engineer is um, an R&D engineer is asked to do something not the same way it was done. before. Yeah, I, I've been talking with others about this topic, R&D, and um, the role title of sustaining engineer has come up as almost the the antithesis of the R and D engineer, right? That they're really in opposite corners of the room. Um, uh, thinking about some of the projects that you've worked on over the years, have you ever seen trends or or um, patterns in some of the common challenges that you run into over and over in R and D? Yeah, so there there's a lot of little um, pieces here and there that that come up a lot. Um, that you need for, like, for example, I work a lot in medical devices. And so there's a lot of medical standards um, that you need to meet. And for those, there's a lot of like electrical isolation and other kind of requirements. And so there's often these little widgets that you need to buy that either do electrical isolation for a signal or um, perform some other um, kind of safety mechanism with that's required by the standards themselves. And oftentimes it, those it's like a little hidden market and maybe there's one or two suppliers that supply those little widgets that you need. And sometimes they're too big, sometimes they're too slow, sometimes they're out of stock. And so a lot of times you run into those kinds of issues where um, it's like a, a, a very specialty item that you need and you don't really want to build it yourself and you have to have it because the standards say you have to have it. And so sometimes um, that's one of the challenges you run into. 
Um, another uh, challenge that I run into a lot is um, standards interpretation. Hmm. So a, a lot of what the work that I end up doing, especially early on when you're uh, defining architectures of things, is is say you want to you want to build a, a medical robot that also needs to meet some construction industry standard for some weird reason, right? Like I'm just making up a high in the sky thing, and so you you have to kind of meet these multiple different requirements, and um, opinions differ on where where the lines of those requirements do go, right? It's a lot like building a house, right, where you have to deal with different you have to deal with the county and the city, and sometimes the city and the county don't agree and and so, uh, one of the challenges that, that I run to often early on is you, you kind of go out to the different ISO or ANSI or whatever standards that define like the screws you have, or they define the housings you have, or they define the electrical, electromechanical equipment that you have. And then you might have another standard, um, that says something else. And you have to kind of define what, well, where does this product lie? Like which parts of which of these standards do we need to comply with? And how do we create that story that all these different regulatory bodies will buy um, and agree with and buy into? And then uh, that that almost 90% defines your product in, in the beginning because you, you just have to meet all these different requirements and kind of going working your way through that minefield can be difficult, especially with stuff like stuff like, for example, a good example would be surgical robotics, right? Where you have all these medical device standards, but then you also have all these robotic standards and automation standards um kind of w- where is the line between those yeah navigating that whole path is challenging uh going back to your your comment about supplied parts and sometimes they're not in stock and sometimes they're hard to find are you familiar with the website chamfer no i'm not they're kind of new um and we had their uh, ceo or, or co-founder on the show just a a month or two ago but it's c h a m f r so a creative spelling without the e at the end and that's what they do is is a low quantity um kind of r and d type qu- quantity uh components for medical device development so interesting yeah you might Pretty check cool. them out i think it's just chamfer.com um, all right. So let's see, moving on here. Most of us, I mean, you work for yourself, so it's a little bit uh, different, but most of us have job titles, right? We're, we're uh, mechanical engineer two or R and D engineer or biomedical engineer or, or whatever it is. Um, and, and sometimes there's a difference between what our job title is and what we actually do. What do you think the role is of an R and D engineer? I think the the role of the R and D engineer is to take requirements and, and 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 you know I do hardware so and and make hardware from it and and kind of define it's almost like world building where where you you kind of take people say I want something that looks like this weighs this amount and it does this function and you go out and on on the beach and pick up ten grains of sand and put them together and, and then show them something and then once you have that kind of architecture and framework. You can iterate, right? Like, and 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 you can move that that whole thing forward. Um, but you really have to have something to throw darts at, like a, a dartboard to start kind of making it happen. And the way that I think about that um, is, it's a series of interfaces. So, so really early on, you kind of have design requirements, and then uh, then the next step is, well, let's define the the subsystems. Who's responsible for those subsystems? And the interfaces, right? Like how do those subsystems interface and how do those people responsible for those subsystems interface? And then and then that starts to give you real structure where you can say, okay, the computer does this, the robot part does this, the mechanical structure does this, and this is how they all connect. And then you start to build that structure. Um, but I think uh, R&D engineer, uh, engineering as a profession is, is different than a lot of other, other engineering because uh, other engineering professions. Because uh, so many other engineers, you're really taught to color within the lines. Like you really said, like these hey, are the thermo th- tables. This is the way that that it is. This is the torque spec from it for an M8 screw into steel. And then an M, uh, an R and D engineer, you're really coloring outside the lines. You're really saying like this is all the things that already exist, and people have written papers and books about them. And we're going to make something different than all that. And to do that, we need to go outside of what they've done. And so. Really, a lot of that is maybe sometimes you're taking a like in a thermo table example. Maybe you're taking a thermo table 
and you're seeing what happens off the end that nobody's ever tested. Or maybe in a, in a torque spec thing, you're, you're looking at maybe you're changing the helical thread pitch of that fastener or, you know, there's just a million different ways to, to change what was done before. Because again, those people just chose lines in the sand based on technology that was available in the late 1800s, in my case, in mechanical engineering. And so that, that's really a lot of what the mechanic or what R and D engineering is, is not only to, to make a new product or a new system, but to push the craft of engineering further in service of that. Oh, I love that. Uh, I, I love your analogy of coloring between the lines versus not. And I might even take it one step further and say for R&D engineering, oftentimes there are no lines at all. You're making up yeah. the lines as you go. It's a new paper. Yeah. yeah. You're choosing what color paper to draw. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Great. Even better. You're choosing what color paper to draw. Yes. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, your your analogy of world building, I also found to be really interesting. I actually, I, I think of building a business like building a, a new small country. And so yes. that that analogy really resonates with me. Do you remember um, where you were or or how you came up with that analogy that R&D engineering is like world building? I, I don't. I, I honestly don't. Yeah. It, it's a really interesting way to think about it. I, I love it. Well, um, as you're world building as an R&D engineer, there are things that that uh, probably go fairly quickly and other things that, that don't go so quickly. Can you think of, of any of those things that maybe you would like to dramatically speed up? You know, what, what are some things that you'd like to be able to do 10 times faster? Um, I can tell you one of the things that um, I feel like uh, myself and the teams that I do a lot faster that maybe hasn't permeated throughout the whole industry um, or kind of one of the things that, that what used to frustrate, frustrate me until me very, re- until very recently. Um, right. And, and that is, um, manufacturing parts. So, uh, I, I work with a lot of like very complex integrated systems. Uh, so I, I sometimes make some software analogies and that helps people that I work with because there's a lot of software people. Um, but basically, uh, in, in the software world, you write a bunch of code, uh, and then you compile it and then you see if it runs. And in mechanical engineering, you write a bunch of code, which I, I view, I view um, SolidWorks as a scripting engine, right? Like it's a, it's a visual scripting engine. So you, you write a bunch of visual scripting code that creates some geometry at the end. And then you export that geometry. And then our form of compiling it is going, getting it and getting it manufactured at machine shops, sheet metal shops, wherever, you know, elect PCB design houses, all that, or PCB assembly houses, that kind of stuff. And sometimes that cycle can take months. And it's, it's not, it's not just difficult in the time, but it's also difficult in all the rigor we're all of just getting quotes, getting POs, getting all the agreements in places in place. And, um, when I help startups kind of build hardware orgs, um, a a lot of what I end up doing and, and 10 years ago, 15 years ago, people in my role, a lot of what they would bring with them is a Rolodex, right? And they'd bring with them a Rolodex of, you know, Joe, who runs a local machine shop, who will get you in line. Cause usually lead times are months for these places. Right. And so this part of this whole digital revolution that was kind of promised um, by Chris Anderson and, and all that stuff on the wired 3d printing stuff, like we, everything was going to be 3d printed and it was all going to be one week lead time. Well, that hasn't really happened. Right. Because 3d printing isn't everything, but what has happened are a lot of these online platforms. Uh, I, I think like the organization you run is very similar. Like 15 years ago, there wasn't a place where I could just say, I need a bunch of automation test equipment. Um, and then in a few months later or a month later, it's done, right? But now there's so many of these kind of like serve, like intermediary services bureaus where um, you can go and get all that stuff sourced. And so what, what has really changed for me, especially even in the last couple of years, is that as, as a design engineer, um, R&D design engineer, we can essentially design hardware and then order it online like we're ordering stuff on amazon custom parts um even stuff like the chamfer thing you just mentioned there's there's just those kinds of things and and that really has taken away maybe half of the time that i used to spend on the phone talking to people going to machine shops and then a lot of times with these machine shops they they would have you source the material because they and it's just like all ends up being a complicated thing and now a lot of those bureaus have taken that complexity away so that we're able to really kind of focus on what we do best. And um, I just want to I just yeah. want to say that uh, for organizations that haven't embraced that yet, um, do so. And I, I encourage you to just kind of not 
not necessarily, I'm not talking about like for manufacturing and high volume stuff. I'm really talking about in within your um, R&D development organization. If you're not turning around designs on in weeks, not months, and you're not testing things in weeks, not months, and you're not expecting um, hardware parts back in weeks, not months, um, maybe reevaluate that. And I think you could find a lot of uh, efficiency in, in in kind of the process. Yeah, that that's great. And I think you're referring to companies like Zometry and Proto Labs, right? Where you can just submit parts online and get a quote auto generated. And fictive. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. All right. What what's one of your proudest accomplishments as an R and D engineer? So um in general, I I try not to talk too much about things I've done recently. Um, for a lot of reason, I I talk about older stuff, but th- this is very very vague. Um, but uh, we had a re- recent accomplish uh, accomplishment with a big big team. Um, I'm, I'm personally very proud of just the engineering accomplishment. But we had a coworker um, uh, mention several times to us uh, that that he was jealous that we were having so much fun as we were kind of you know, working the extra hours, doing the extra, extra work. And it was kind of like in, in the difficult part of the project. And, and I think that's what I'm most proud of is, is not, not the fact that we're, you know, we're able to do good, cool things and, and design cool things, but to, to, um, have fun and love ourselves while, while doing that is, is also. Hey Amen, brother. You're speaking to the choir here. Uh, the, the, the purpose at pipeline is to promote joy in the lives of our team members. And without the joy, you know, what's, what's the point really? So yeah. love that. Well, what what is something that you wish um, maybe even other engineers or or engineering leadership would realize about R and D engineering that that maybe they don't fully appreciate? You know, not having been in the shoes of an R and D engineer. I think that it it's foundationally, fundamentally built on failure, and you have to do that. You you have to be prepared for it. You have to be ready for it. And, um, and you have to just keep going. And, the one of the best examples that I have of that is, um, so early on, I, I've worked a lot in the LVAD artificial heart industry, right? And so there, there's a very famous company in that world called Thoratech, uh, that's now part of Medtronic. And, um, they in the, I think this is in the eighties. So basically th- this is a really good story. So I'm going to take some time on it. Please. So ATK Thiokol um, is a is a company, and then based in uh, Utah, right? So they they built the solid rocket bo- boosters for the shuttle, and then one of the other big rocket engine producers in America is called Aerojet, and they're based out of Rancho Cordova, uh, Sacramento, and so they built uh, the F one engine uh, for Apollo. And so one of the big big challenges when you're building these things is are the turbo pumps. So um, I forget the exact spec, but an Apollo F1 engine burns like 40,000 gallons of cryogenic fuel a second or something like that. Wow. It's, 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 it's more than you can comprehend, right? And it's, it's ultra cold. It has to be pumped at a, a like perfectly right rate or else you start having that pogo effect, right? Very, very, very detailed. And so the people charged with that were Aerojet in, in Rancho Cordova, Sacramento. Basically, it's called a turbo pump. It basically looks like a turbo in your car, but it runs at way higher RPM. And you use some of the exhaust to turn one side, and then the other side pumps the propellant. And there's an unbelievable temperature differential between the two sides. So you have all these magic materials. And so that's one of those things when um, when Kennedy said, uh, you know, we're going to have to invent new metals to go to the moon. This is one of those situations where they had to invent new metals to make these turbo pumps. And so uh, the people that did that out in Rancho Cordova at Aerojet, uh, the, this is like years later, Apollo's no longer, they're still making some rockets, but whatever. And then um, the, the story is that Lyndon Johnson started having heart failure. And then the U.S. government was like, well, we, we can go to the moon. So, of course, we can make an artificial heart. And so at Aerojet, they actually, I've actually held it in my hand. They had a nuclear artificial heart where it had a thermal pile on one side and a Stirling engine on the other. No, no like, way. Wow. And it just used the DK of, of uh, and the, the thermal gradient to huh. run a sterling engine. And it was like implanting two golf balls. And so, so it didn't work. They didn't do it. But that was the start, right? And so long story short, um, uh, another uh, gentleman named uh, Dr. Wampler um, proved that you could pump blood not by having like a bellows pump that pumps 
like this. Um, but you could have a, a pump it with like a an axial flow pump, like a jet ski, where you just have a channel and then a propeller spinning inside of it. And as long as you do things, design things certain ways and run it a certain way, you don't get too much what's called hemolysis, which is destruction of the red and white blood cells. Um, and so he proved that in a patient uh, in Texas early on. And then so uh, the whole industry kind of pivoted to say, hey, let's make a tiny little pump that's like a little jet ski motor. And you basically embed magnets in the rotor and then you have a bunch of coils wrapped around the outside. And then you just have a propeller spinning in blood. And then you put jewel bearings like in a watch, little literal jewel bearings with a, a pin and a socket on both ends. And they're called blood washed bearings. And then um, that that's the heart mate too. And they've implanted that in 30,000 people. Um, there are people that have been kept alive over 10 years longer that would have normally just died. It's it's And then it's now been superseded by with the heart mate three, which is full magnetic levitation. But the reason why I'm telling this story is the HeartMate 2, when they initially designed that pump, um, they had a previous pump that was one of those bellows pumps, and they actually put uh, centered titanium microspheres all on the inside of the pump, just like you do on the outside of a hip implant. If you see like a hip implant, they do that, and then that, that makes it easy for all of the bone and tissue to grow in and really grab a hold of it. And they found that if they put that same microsphered surface on the inside of the artificial heart, that you got what's called a pseudo neo intima layer, which is kind of like the biofilm that the body grows over stuff. And then and then you don't have a uh, synthetic material. It's literally like a body material on the inside of that. And so they were like, oh, let's put that same stuff on this new rotary pump, the HeartMate 2. So they so they took the rotary pump that worked real good. They did a bunch of animal studies and they, were, they put all the microspheres on it. And they're like, okay, let's go do human studies, right? And then they go do the human studies. The first 10 pumps clot off immediately, just get filled up with blood, totally clot off, stop working immediately. And these things, things cost millions of dollars. Like this is, this is like multi-million dollar disaster. And, uh, and so they, they, a lot of times, it, a lot of investors, you would just cut it off then just like cut it off. Didn't work, but you stay, they stuck with it. Right. And so they took the, the microspheres off. They put the microspheres on just some particular parts of the pump. That took them time, a year or two. And then they went back to the clinic and then slowly kind of incrementally improved the little improvements here and there. And then, then it became kind of the standard of care, the standard of treatment, and it saved tens of thousands of lives. And so um, I, I think that that's like my best example of it. it, it even if you do everything exactly right and hire all the best experts in the world and do everything that you should do, it might be a spectacular failure initially, but you need to just do the work. Like nose to the grindstone, do the investigation, look at it under a microscope, figure out what's going on and just incrementally make those improvements and then get there and just kind of trust the process of engineering. I love it. What a great example. And as I'm listening to you talk about this, Ian, I, I just, it's so clear to me that like, you are the quintessential engineer, right? Like uh, uh, other people are are playing little games on their phone. You're out reading articles about engineering and just gathering all these stories and information. I, I love it. All right. Um, I'm, I'm going to take a real short break here and, and share with the listeners that teampipeline.us is where you can learn more about how we help medical device and other product engineering or manufacturing teams develop turnkey equipment, custom fixtures, and automated machines to characterize, inspect, assemble, manufacture, and perform verification testing on your devices. We're speaking with Ian McCathern today. Uh, Ian, when when you wake up in the morning, what like what is it that that drives you to do what you do? Um, I mean, what what brings the joy into your life as an engineer? And then conversely, what's something that really frustrates you about R and D engineering? I um, it, it's a bit of a long story. I uh, and and it's kind of captured by the the, the kind of Neil Armstrong quote on my website. I my my grandfather was a um, an Okie, right? So from the Grapes of Wrath, but he was from Nebraska, basically, and he was a second youngest of twelve. And uh, his they had a family farm in Nebraska um, in the twenties. And uh, his mother died, and so they lost the farm, and so the whole family just kind of um, 
separated. And then my grandfather eventually um, rode the rails all the way to California and he got a job picking fruit in the, in the orchards in California, Northern California. And then while he was there, um, they had ads. This was in the um, like 19 teens, late and late 19 teens. And there was an ad um, for the submarine force and in the Navy. And so he said that he joined the submariner force because it paid the best out of the, all, all the forces. So he came down to San Francisco, joined the submariner force, and then um, was on a boat called the USS Sori, and then was stationed at Pearl Harbor. Um, and he was there that morning on December 7th, um, and he said he was eating breakfast, and they gave him a rifle. And uh, that was his job, was to just shoot at the planes with a rifle. Um, and then, uh, you know, that that wasn't the man I knew, right? Like, I, I'm born way, way, way after that. Um, but then many years later, the, the man I knew um, had carried, like, he, and, and after his death, I, I've since learned a lot of more history about him. Like, I, I you know, I got the history of his boat from the Naval Maritime Museum in, in Amsterdam and I, you know, all, all the other historical things. And um, he was at a lot of the rather more unpleasant things in the Pacific theater. And um, a, lo- a lot of the stories he had were uh, just really harrowing. Right. And, um, and then after, after all that, he, he lost a lung. Um, like he, he was like very damaged physically um, by the war. And then after that, he came back and he had, a, he worked for Martin Marietta. And uh, first in Colorado, but then they moved to Florida. And uh, my grandfather was part of the Mercury Project and the Apollo Project. And my grandfather, my grandmother, my mom, and my uh, uncle saw the moonshot take off. Um, and on my mom or on my grandmother's deathbed, um, I asked her about it because I didn't really talk to her much about it. And I asked her on her on her deathbed, and she was pretty far into dementia, right? And she instantly came back and she looked my wife and I in the eye and she said, it still makes my scalp tingle. It is the most incredible thing I have ever seen. And, um, and through my grandfather's life, like I spent a lot of time with him and, uh, growing up and he, uh, was part of the occupation of Japan after the war. And he had all this Japanese memorabilia. He taught us how to teach, um, how to cook Japanese, how to use chopsticks. He w- just ne- was the kind of guy that would never say a disparaging person about anybody. Uh, it's disparaging thing about anybody, especially what would have been considered his former enemies. Right. And, and at the time I didn't know the gift he was giving me, you know, like at the time I'm just a dumb kid getting erased by this wonderful man. But now as an adult and having kind of like really comprehended the, every the gravity of what what happened to him and then also in in retirement like he he had a pension from the navy he had a pension from martin and then after that after retiring from martin so he retired from the navy he retired from martin and then after that he was a sergeant at arms at the colorado state capitol and then he got pension from that so so any one of those careers would be a, a career of service right and he had three and, um, he also had, you know, purple heart, like there, there is no more honorable man or person than, than my grandfather. And he really, like, he, he didn't use it as a way as clout as like, like he, he, you wouldn't think it. like he was the most humble, kind person. And like later, late in his life, like he, um, he, he was, you know, cancer, right. It gets us all, but he, he was like suffering and he came, he was walking down the street and there was a, there was a handicapped man. Um, that was having trouble backing up his, his handicap capable truck, uh, out of the, out of the parking spot. And it was set up where there was no driver's seat, right? There, Cause the guy had like a lift and he moved his thing in, but in the front. And so my grandpa offered to help him. My grandpa was on his knees in his eighties, standing in this van, trying to help this guy back up. And he messed something up and there was like a minor incident and he got hit in his head. But I just remember us all being so weird and telling him like, you can't, you got to stop. You got to stop helping everybody. <laughs> like, you got to stop doing it. Um, and so, so, and, and the, the Navy taught him to be an electrical engineer. And so the, the Navy um, gave him something and he was always really grateful. For that. He was always really grateful for the life that, that he was given. Right. And so um, maybe like I, I just came out knowing what I wanted to do. And I was very fortunate to have um, kind of the high school and college education, um, path kind of laid out for me so it wasn't difficult for me to to go to college to go to a good engineering school 
to graduate and I had all of the support and a lot of people really rooting for me and, and a lot of people that really kind of borrowed from themselves and invested in me um, to get there. And so in my opinion, if I don't do something at least half meaningful with that, and you know, like a lot of people have gone a long way to get me to here. And so if I kind of don't do something helpful or people for that, um, that that's not what I want. Yeah. Wow. You know, I, I remember part of the story from the last time you were on, and I think you've shared even more details now. First of all, your grandfather just sounds like an incredible man. Thank you for sharing that. I think a lot of people listening are, are going to feel uplifted by by a, a, a few details from his life. And um, uh, it, it's like you have this responsibility, right? Yep. To, that's, to, that's the word. Yeah. 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 That's, that's, <laughs> it, it makes me feel um, almost a little guilty. I was at uh, dinner with my dad one night and he says, what are you going to do in, you know, for work when, when you graduate high school? This is back when I was a, a senior in high school. And I was like, oh, I, I don't know. I'm not really sure. I was more into surfing and hanging out with my friends, right? And he says, oh, you should consider engineering. And I said, yeah, okay, that sounds good. And that was seriously about as much thought as I gave to it. Turns out my dad knows me pretty well, and, and it was a really good fit. But uh, I mean, I don't, I don't know how, quite to say this. Like, uh, I, I wish I had a, a story like yours. Um, mine is much, much simpler. But um, uh, it, it's so compelling and motivating to hear you talk about it and like it makes me feel like, oh yeah, I really do have this great gift, and I, I should probably do more with it than than I am even. So, anyway, I'm I'm just rambling now. Um, what what are what are one or two things that you think are are really very difficult about teaching uh, someone to become an R and D engineer? Maybe like uh, a student who has just graduated, or or a young engineer who hasn't really um, cut their teeth yet in the R and D world. It's really hard to know what what rules you can break and what rules you can't break, and and so it, it's kind of like the 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 natural built world and the human built world, right? So like like you can break you can break the human built world world rules, like you can jaywalk, not going to die, but the natural world rules, like crossing the Amazon, you're going to die, and so it, it, that's the way I kind of view it. Is um, in R and D engineering, you need to know what are kind of general rules that have been identified in standards or in books that are human defined and what rules are like rules of physics you're never going to get around. And and so fundamentally like and even like um running a business like like yours or an engineering business, you have to parse through that all the time. I've had three or four people ask me to build perpetual motion machines. And now I'm really, really good at understanding early on that this is a perpetual motion machine right <laughs> and and at first i wasn't because you kind of believe people they have like a whole story and uh but the like the there's fundamental rules you can't you can't break like and i'm reminded like one of my favorite episodes of the simpsons is um homer says lisa in this house we obey the second law of thermodynamics and and i always <laughs> think of it that way like we, you have to obey the laws of thermodynamics but you don't have to obey all the laws in in the machine design class. i i your mention of uh, perpetual motion machine just reminds me of this story I have to share real, real quickly. Back, um, oh, shoot, this is probably 13, 14 years ago. It was, it was quite a while ago, uh, back when I was a newer engineer. Uh, a, a gentleman that I knew, a uh, respectable guy, a successful guy, he, he owned his own business. He came to me one day. Um, we're in the same church group, and, and so we knew each other there. He came to me and said, hey, I've, I've got this idea, this invention that I want to make. And so he started describing the invention to me, and and as he spoke more, I started realizing, hold on, this sounds like a perpetual motion machine. And, and I said that, and, and he stops me right away. No, 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 it's not a perpetual motion machine. Well, what you're describing to me, sir, it is a perpetual motion machine. Anyway, um, <laughs> he ended up working in my... <laughs> <laughs> I just, I can't even say it without laughing now. <laughs> he ended up working in my garage for months on this perpetual motion machine because <laughs> because his wife wouldn't let him work on it at home. <laughs> just in her house, they obey the laws. That's exactly. <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> 
<laughs> my, my wife would get up in the morning and then here's this guy in our garage <laughs> putting oh uh, it was it was just it was too much I, eventually I, I drew a free body diagram and i it, i said hey this is why it, it won't work it just it's not going to work and i don't know if he accepted that or, or he said the, just thought that i wasn't uh i wasn't the right partner anymore but uh he he stopped soon after that and uh Okay, speaking of magic here, if if you could wave a magic wand and and change one thing about your role as an R and D engineer, what would it be? I I really really enjoy making stuff, like ma- making new stuff. Um, almost all of it doesn't really bother me. Um, what does bother me is, and and I think it it's it's not like an R and D engineering thing. I and, and this isn't specific. Like I have a, have a good friend who's a who's a lawyer, right? And just like could not be very, di- more different than kind of my job, but we're really good friends for a long time. Um, and and he said like it, he, about something in his business. He said it, it's just like any business. It's about relationship, right? And so and so in in my view, it, this isn't really an R and D thing. This this applies to any relationship, any business relationship. And the, the difficulty I have sometimes is, um, like, because for all the reasons we already discussed, like I really bleed for my craft because I choose to, right? Like I, I, if I, like, if I do a calculation and it's wrong, I am deeply cut. Um, and that's, that's not nobody else's fault but mine. Right. And, and so if, if, if someone, and there's a lot of people like Right. There's a lot of extremely, extremely passionate professionals, not just engineers, all kinds of professionals. Right. And and you you kind of do that, you do that bleeding, and then you you take it and you go to that design review, you go to that whatever presentation. And then um invariably, uh, and and you'll find this more so in like more toxic cultures and less so in less toxic cultures. And that's why so many leaders talk about like making the right hires and making sure to not pull toxicity from a toxic culture um and and some people have kind of for lack of a better term like like uh baggage and 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 when when you have this kind of contemptuous environment where where it's like okay he, here's a design that i made that i think solves our problems and then um you have healthy criticism that says i don't think it solves that i don't think it solves that hey this material i've used before and we had a bad experience i don't think you should count on that way that's all great feedback that's why we have a team. That's that's the good stuff. Um, what what is difficult when is when um, some folks are like the conversation steers towards like, in the past I had an engineer tell me something and it didn't end up being true, so I don't trust engineers. And and those kind of like more like less specific nitpicks, but more just like I don't trust you kind of stuff. And and that ends up being. It's just difficult all around and and you end up having like a pretty 30% of everybody's energy goes towards that, right? And and so I think uh it, it's not exclusive to R&D, but but it is um uh, maybe more common hey. because there's a lot more failure in the startup world like like uh in the startup world 1 in 10 is the the rule of thumb that you're supposed to be successful versus not. And the, the nine startups that aren't successful, that doesn't mean that they didn't do good engineering and that the engineers that work there aren't good and blah, blah, blah. Sometimes it's just the market change. Sometimes it's just that the market couldn't bear the price that they thought. They made some broad, bad kind of business assumptions. Um, and and so I think the the real challenge or, or what I could change is if it, this is kind of like a unicorns and rainbows thing, but I, I would. I just want everybody's culture to be positive and bubbly and nice and encouraging to each other, um, and and somehow mad, wave a magic wand and get rid of the kind of the negative part of culture. And I think we, not just in engineering, but in in all professions, we would all be better off. I could not agree with you more. Um, I I I love jujitsu. I do this jujitsu class a few times a week. And the place that I go, the coach is this big hulking guy. He competes in the ultra heavyweight um, competitions. And if you were to just look at him, you would be intimidated because he's just, he's just this big guy, right? And like, um, doing martial arts, but he's really very gentle. He's like this, uh, big teddy bear. Although if you were like rolling with him in a match, you, you wouldn't think that anyway, um, where I'm going with this is, uh, he, he always encourages everyone to like, be nice to each other. You know, he'll say regularly, Hey, we're not here to hurt each other. 
We're here to help each other. So like, yeah. be nice to your, your sparring partner, right? Be kind to each other, help each other. And I think the reason that so many people go to this particular gym is uh, not just because of the technical instruction that's given there, but because of the culture that he's yeah. created, right? Where people are there to just help each other. Um, and it's, it's a joy to be there. And uh, for sure, the same thing is true in in engineering, hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, m- maybe this next question is already answered by what you've just said, but maybe there's some other answers as well. W- what are some of the most important attributes or or mindsets that you think an R and D engineer needs to have? I think um, tenacity is is one of them, and and I think it it's it's. There's so the few things. So there's um, a thing called Aiken's Laws of Spacecraft Design. If anybody hasn't seen that, look it up. Uh, A K I N Aiken's Laws of Spacecraft Design. Um, one of his laws of spacecraft design is the 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 number of required iterations to mm. get your design perfect is one more than you have done. Uh, <laughs> and and so I, it it could not be more true. And and so I think the the key is just like and I I a lot of people I've coached on this as well. Right when you think it's the time to give up, just try it one more time, and and that's exactly what R R and D engineering is. It's usually the person that just tried one more time, and and it's it's really more about incremental steps in the right direction and knowing what the right direction is and being able to measure that, um, like the light bulb. Right? There's there's a lot of great examples of that, and and so I, I think that stick to it. It's not it's not really like you just have this aha moment, write something down, and go make something that perfectly works well. It's really a process, and so I I really think that that um, that's key. Uh, nine times out of ten, or maybe ninety nine times out of a hundred, persistence, or in your words, tenacity, beats yep. brilliance. Right? Maybe that one time out of a hundred, it really does require a mega genius to solve the problem. But way more often than not, it's the guy who's willing to keep hammering away at the problem that solves it, not the guy who's you know the smartest one in the room. Yeah, this is the tortoise, not the hare. Yep. There you go. Yep, yep. All right. Well, let's see. Uh, I think we just got one more question here, and then and then we'll wrap things up. Let's pretend it's three years from now, and you're looking back over the last three years, kind of reflecting. What needs to be true for you to feel happy and fulfilled within your role as an R and D engineer? Sure. Uh, so I, I'm I've reached a kind of an interesting inflection point. I um. I, I didn't really say I'd, I'd say this too much, and I, I, it doesn't mean I'm not going to keep learning. But I, I'm I'm pretty happy with my skill set, and I really really enjoy just making the things that I make. Um, and I really don't even you know I I don't necessarily want to you know go leaps and bounds further. I, you know I don't I don't have aspirations to be a CEO of a startup or, or things like that. I really I really just want to build and design good hardware and lead and build good hardware teams. And, um, and so that, that's really fun. And there's a little bit of kind of taking a deep breath and relaxation that comes with that, where, where now some of that extra energy that I used to use, um, to kind of, you know, climb the ladder for lack of a better term. Um, I really want to use to, uh, give back to the community and by the community, I mean, the engineering community. Um, so over the last, uh, several years I've, I've, I have like, you know, just like our, our relationship, right? Like I've built quite a few relationships with other, you know, passionate engineers and a lot of younger engineers. And I, I make it a point every, every week to answer questions on like, uh, there's like a mechanical engineering and a machinist Reddit subreddit. And so I make it a point to kind of answer questions there and through, through just kind of doing that and meeting people in a lot of the local universities, um, a lot of folks have reached out. And so, uh, I really want to start to dedicate a lot more, more of my time towards, um, not mentorship is kind of too specific of a term, but, but really just kind of helping out other engineers, other young engineers. And then also I, I really want to start to put out, uh, just maybe, maybe on my website or something, but just some like free basic guides on, on how to, to get to where I've been, where I am as an engineer. Um, because the, the path was not very clear to me at all. Um, and, and I just kind of bumbled here over the last 20 years and, one of the things that was really, really impactful for me is I heard a an NPR piece a long time ago about um, why are there so many great Jamaican sprinters, and and the they do all this research and uh, you know it's not demographic, it's not it doesn't have anything to do with any of those things. What what it has to do with is if 
if you're a young person in Jamaica and you want to be a sprinter, it's a very obvious, clear career path to do it. Like, like the steps are in front of you. You see it. It's on TV. It's everywhere. But if you're a young engineer in Jamaica and you want to be a product design engineer, or like me, if you want to be a product design engineer, design medical devices, and you went to the Colorado School of Mines and, and learned a lot about not making products, right? Um, a lot, a lot of engineering that's also important to making products, but I also, you know, there's not so much a product design school, right? And, and th that path is not very clear. And so, um, what, what are, my goal is just kind of, kind of start to flesh that out for young people, because uh, when you go into these schools, they say, oh, do you want to be an electrical, mechanical, or civil engineer? But there's no clue as to how these organizations are built. How, how does, how does, how does like a, a robotics organization work and what are the skill sets they need? What are the different things that people do and what's the best way to go into each of those? And how is that all architected? And no, nowhere is there really that. And a lot of people have that because their parents were in the business, right? And so like a lot of people that I've, that I've encountered, they have a, a real good vision of what they want because their, their parents kind of gave them that view of how these organizations run and how these organizations work. Um, but I just, I just want to kind of help do some of that. I don't know. I love it. That's, that's beautiful, man. Uh, the engineering world. And I, I just say the world in general is lucky to have you in. And, and I'm just very grateful that you've been able to take some more time today and spend it with us here on the podcast, sharing some of that wisdom and, and insight. So thank you so much for doing that. Um, anything else that you'd like to share before we wrap things up? Uh, no, just stay awesome, everybody. Thank you. Good advice. All right. Uh, how can people get in touch with you? I have a website. Uh, it's iancallmcatherine.com and all my contact information is there. Wonderful. All right. Well, Ian, thank you so much. Sure appreciate your time today. Um, talk to you later. Thank you. I'm Aaron Moncur, founder of Pipeline Design and Engineering. If you liked what you heard today, please share the episode. To learn how your team can leverage our team's expertise developing turnkey equipment, custom fixtures, and automated machines, and with product design, visit us at teampipeline.us. Thanks for listening.